start off, uh, for those who don't know you, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a 1960s recidivist, uh, born out of the, the 60s culture. Uh, Went through college, headed for pre-med, uh, worked in the hospital, figured that was not such a great idea. I mean, I was headed for psychiatric uh, hospitals, actually, and I went and worked in one. And So that didn't work out. Reverted to medicine, went to uh, Peace Corps in South Korea, rural health thing for two and a half years, and discovered there that the... Um, third world peoples needed revolutions far more than they needed white boy medicine. So ended up coming to Japan and working on what we thought was cultural revolutionary activities and it slowly became more political and have been doing activism and um, primarily against corporate targets. Um, or having been targeted by corporations engaging in self-defense operations against vast corporate entities um, and all the confrontations that have occurred with with corporate life and trying to understand corporate life and trying to figure out a way to redeem the planet from its effects. So, so we've got a pretty screwed up planet. I mean, you know, there's so much terrible stuff going on. You know, you go to places like India and you just see terrible pollution everywhere, um, you see, uh, you know, just so much sickness and illness and, and uh, you know, we've got supposedly sea level rise, global warming, da, 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 lots of terrible things going on, war going on. Um, so we've got a planet that's sick or a species that's sick or a civilization that's sick, there's an illness. But, um, you know, if you're going to be the doctor here and identify the disease, you know, what's, what's the cause of this? Why are we so sick? What's going on? Well, again, you have if you look at all of these different ecological and financial and military and social um, background of things, you find that like 90% of the problems we face, 90% of the problems we get are galvanized around and are immediately critically threatened by, the background is all sort of the same crowd of characters. I mean, you, you have a lot of different symptoms, and those symptoms have attracted a lot of different single issue groups to deal with them again you know whether it's gmos or nuclear power or the the fishing out of the seas i mean there's the list <laughs> is depressingly endless and we have a certain discrete population i think of people that that are genetically predisposed to care to actually feel some empathy with others and it, when they see others suffering, whether other happens to be another human community or an, a, a bio, I mean, an ecosystem that is not directly connected to their life, but it still somehow touches them. Those kind of people are spread through all levels of society and all societies. And if they could have more accurate information about what it is that is the real cause of this and not just be racing around from one symptom to another, then we could presumably come up with, you know, with an intelligent uh, and well-manned and well-womaned uh, activist group that would confront that at a more primal level than first responder kind of actions that we constantly put in. So the idea is, what is the background thing? And if you look in the back, and it, and it is these corporate entities, and in isolation or in combination then how, how is the human race supposed to deal with this essentially social organism that it's created? And that, that is, the, I think, the biggest key, is to have people realize that the corporations, besides being logos, besides being their PR blasts that sort of identify them vaguely in our mind, or instead of being legal fictions or artificial persons as they're deemed in law, that they're actually living systems, and that they are, they are knitted together intimately, you know, for eight to ten hours a day, and for potentially infinite amounts of time, and they are sort of this whirlpool of human attention, 
that is is being routed and uh, assigned to a single task, which is to extract money from the surrounding universe. And some will do it in the manufacturing sphere, some will do it in the, the distribution, some will do it in the energy sector, it doesn't make any difference. The point is that when you get these large entities that grow out, they, because of their size, and they, the lack of the fact that they're not localized, they don't respond to local uh, feedback loops. I mean, they don't have to live in the pollution that they create, and they don't have to live in the devastation that they often wreak in their resource gathering, etc. So they, they have a, a level of isolation from the body politic and their immediate effects upon it that make them really dangerous because all they're concerned about is extracting wealth, personal wealth, personal profit in a, in a very limited, impoverished sense <laughs> from anything that they look at and anything that they touch. But, but to more specifically identify the threat here, um, you're talking about corporations, but it, I mean, uh, is it just big corporations? I mean, a, a local mom and pops corporation down the road, are they a problem? Is it just Coca-Cola and Shell? I mean, you know, the actual the actual problem here, is it is it the entire corporate structure in the entire world? No, it's, it's scale. I mean, it is largeness overall. I mean, I, I think humans have sort of viscerally had a, a fear and loathing of hugeness, unless they were, of course, on top of it and they, and they were wielding it for their benefit. But most people surrounding those entities, whether they were huge churches, whether they were huge governments, whether they were huge corporations, they all saw that there was something in the life of that entity, both internally and in the way the people inside were shaped and acted, and its effects upon the outside universe, that was essentially unhealthy for human life and evolution and probably the entire biosphere. I mean, if people get really sensitive to this. So it's the scale of things. I mean, small. when things are small, it, it doesn't make any difference. In terms of the economic sphere, it doesn't make any difference what their format is. I mean, right-wing Republicans have no problem with kibbutz communism in, in Israel, you know, and it's pure communism there as opposed to the state variety. And in back in the worst or darkest days of the Soviet Union, they had a lot of shops all throughout Moscow that were called cooperatives that were ironically capitalistic. And they didn't have a problem with that either. And so this, once something, once virtually anything arises above a certain threshold of scale that isolates it, its feedback from the, the living environment and makes its own progress into history more important than the community it's supposed to be is supposed to be served by these entities, then you've, you've got not only a problem, at a certain scale, you've got a full-blown planetary disaster. Um, you know, so we hear about the terrible things big corporations are doing. I mean, Coca-Cola, for example, in India, buy up almost all of their water supply and then sell it back to them, you know, for huge profits and stuff like that. Um, I mean, there's a million, zillion, zillion examples of big corporations doing terrible things, but are all big corporations bad? I mean, you know, is every every large-scale corporation a negative entity on this planet? I mean, for example, Google. Google is enormous. I mean, it's the biggest, you know, internet company in existence, as far as I'm aware. And, um, you know, like, it provides us all of these wonderful free services because it's so big. You know, Gmail, I mean, Google Maps. Google Maps, I just read, employs 7,100 people, you know? And if if... Google weren't such a massive corporation. Maybe it couldn't couldn't provide these things for us, you know, such high quality for such low cost or for free, you know. And so, I mean, are is big necessarily bad in all cases? I mean, is it just some yes? Examples? <laughs> <laughs> Please elaborate. There is a certain level. I mean, the only argument that you can make for bigness is the fact that it gives you a, a uniform supply of something or other. In, at a scale which you could not imagine if things were at a lower level of organization in terms of their size. That is not much of a trade-off in terms of what their actual impact is. I mean, the, the, a lot of people freak out about Google precisely because they have such huge data res reservoirs now. And they have their, you know, the, when they started off, what was it, do no evil or <coughs> some basic uh, ethical command. Mantra, they call it. Huh? Mantra. Mantra. Okay, that is 
all fine until things get sort of edgy. It took them a while to work themselves out of the the China market. I mean, they were they were very tempted there. And when these guys that were started to gradually get replaced, as they are getting replaced by more corporate shiny shoot types, the bean counting will, I think, be able to exceed the mantra chanting in certain of their activities. And plus the fact that they, when they concentrate that much personal data, and the government or other entities also lust for that data, and they have regulatory rights over these organizations, you ha- you're setting up a very dangerous equation that we don't usually come out on the winning end of, you know, as individual bipeds. You know, the organizational forms, the orga- organizational forces, the organizational societies. I mean, they, they are, they've, they've created another species level of function, you know, where now policies and governmental policies in particular are part of what define their environment. And as living entities, they want to redesign the environment to fulfill their needs. And when their needs do not correspond with our needs, we get crushed in in terms of what they want in terms of, like, international trade practices. You know, everything that essentially puts some form of bridling or curbing force upon them that obstructs their growth in a desired direction, which we would think would be, you know, the things like the precautionary principle, you know, or protection of of local cultures or protection of local ecosystems. All of this stuff that is valuable to us has no value at all to them, and they have the resources to essentially buy it out of existence. Money is a great corrosive of all democratic entities and all democratic processes, and you pour enough money on something, and, you know, it's like like the old thing about dropping a pearl into a Coke, and the next day it's gone. You know, you can you can dissolve a lot of really hard won laboriously <laughs> created legal protections with just the sweep of a hand and a, and a lobbyist wallet. You know, and this has happened constantly. I mean, that and that's what we're facing right now. We got, in America, we have two parties that have both been entirely bought and paid for by the same crowd, and they're just fighting over who's going to to sit in the big chair, but in terms of everybody else that's going to be ruled by their policies, it's it's the corporate agenda, flat. And so you're talking about corporations being a cause of our ills here, and, and not just corporations, but big corporations. I mean, is, is big government also responsible for, yes. for the problem? Yes, that's what I'm saying. Any, so any, anything, that's anything that swells out of, out of proportion to what it, its humane purpose might once have been, is essentially antithetical to our our evolution and progress, and apparently to our our peace and sanity and <laughs> and health also. I mean, there had the Roman Empire, or you know, none of these places were particularly profoundly popular in the provinces. You know, we we tend to think about the great empires of history from the point of view of the guys that lived in the capital and guys that had the perks and then when they spread the money on to the artists and created all this beautiful stuff. But where all that was extracted from and the conditions people endured to make that work, we don't actually see or hear about. And that, right now, the the blessings of the internet and the blessings of this kind of technology is that you're hearing more voices and more voices are talking about more pain (laughs) closer to the ground and you're starting to see that things don't correlate very well. So, I mean, it correlates in terms of how big something is, essentially how inhuman and unrealistic it becomes as a uh, activity focus. I mean, th- I really believe, I mean, uh, that you can make a po- almost a point-by-point comparison with big corporations and, uh, and tumors and cancer. And the fact that the, the planet now including our resources, I mean, as people in terms of what the banks have done to individual livelihoods, let alone what they've done to the environment as a whole, is a perfect cancer model. I mean, the idea of cancer in the first place, you have your body is made up of all these communities of of active and specialized cells that are in charge of certain 
bits and pieces of your metabolism. So when they're when they're functioning and they're functioning in harmony, we call that health. We, you know, and that is the simplicity of when when things sort of pay attention to what's going on around them. When you but then certain cells, and this can happen in the nervous system, it can happen in the bones, it can happen in the blood, it can happen anywhere in the body. Certain cells will get aggravated or mutated to a certain point where they forget what it is that they were doing and they just know that growing seems to be the simplest thing to do and not to fulfill any particular useful function except their own growth and their own enhancement as a physical blob. And those grow up in every part of the body and they also grow up in every part of the economy. And they get to be larger than the public purpose for which they were designed to serve. I mean, the, the whole idea to create these things in the first place, there were two basic ideas. One was to protect investors and to protect the, the charter uh, issuing aristocratic authorities of Europe and in that Part so that when they sent things off to the east, they couldn't lose more money than what it is they put in. So that was one thing, the whole idea of limited liability. And that attracted a lot of relatively unsavory <laughs> attention from people when you think you can actually go out and act in the world and not have any ultimate responsibility for it as a person. That frees you from a lot of moral and ethical <laughs> baggage because you're never going to face the consequences of your actions in their fullness. Right? So the, the whole point of, of corporations at, at one level was to allow certain people to consolidate more wealth, protect it during its growth, and be able to get out relatively cheaply if things went awry. So that, as a little model, I mean, that's fine. And, and for a neighborhood, like for a gas station or a hardware store or, some, or a barber who is afraid of lawsuits or something like that Th this these all become you know very local particularized things but when they're blow into these huge multi thousand multi tens of thousands you know I mean you, you've got corporations now that are approaching a million in employee uh, management Foxconn in China for Christ's sake and Walmart and it's all its morphing forms Th they they have totally lost connectivity with the planet's needs and there's local society's needs and they're just they're just ballooning because it makes sense for their own internal agenda and they have just like tumors do they end up deceiving the central powers of the body of the body politic to saying not only are they they should be supported, but they're actually necessary for the life and health and future of the body. So, I mean, you're, some of the pe cancers, I mean, you probably know, we have seen these horrible pictures, they can get huge in the body. And the body is furiously feeding them, you know. I mean, it's been totally <laughs> deceived into the fact that this is a really important part of us and we really got to pump all of our resources into it until they explode, literally. And, and so, you know, if, if corporations are a cancer on our civilization, on our world, on human race, and on everything here, uh, what do we do about them? What's the cure for the cancer? Shrink them. <laughs> and, and how do we shrink them? Well, the, the problem is that they are so big that in medical terms they're inoperable. You know, it's like a brain cancer that is so infused in your assorted neuron patches that if trying to extract it would destroy your brain. Economy, you know, in this case. Yes, and so the when they become that interwoven with our daily life, we can't take them out as we wish we could in the Occupy world <laughs> with, with a brush of the hand or you know some radical new law or even a radical new leader. They they really have to be taken down as they are in many biological settings. And they are they're, they go into remission, you know, and they, you can exercise, you can put a lot of impact on them. I mean, in the body, it's done with chemicals and radiation and all that. But there are also many cases where the body itself figures out what's going on 
and the immune system starts to nibble away at things and, to, and gradually it just subsides. And the body itself decides that this, this is not a, a, a good long-term strategy to keep feeding this tumor because the tumor is given nothing back. And so it, it starts to shut down. So they're, find, they're trying to find, I mean, the medical thing, they want a saleable lock and key solution to this. And, but people have known about spontaneous remission for a long time. And it essentially depends on the power of the immune system. And that's what we have to spread within society is the, the parallel knowledge of our own immune cells about what is actually an invasive alien species amongst us and how you bring that down. And once you, once you make that decision, then all these different, literally thousands of different f- flavors and varieties of activists have something to contribute. Be- but, mm. Sorry, if, if this is, uh, if these uh, giant corporations and big government and anything that's really big, um, if we start looking at them as an alien species, maybe you know we'll think of them differently and want to kind of reduce them. But at the moment, I don't see any hope for um, remission, really. I mean, for example, I'm recording on this camera. This camera is made by a giant corporation. So is you know the microphone. So the lights. So is you know everything. Um, and when I want a new camera, I'm just going to go to a giant corporation to get it because well, it's the cheapest option and probably the only option. Um, same, you know, with uh, email. I want the best service available, so I'm going to go to the giant corporation Google that provides it for me. And I'm not unique. I mean, that's the problem. Every single person on the planet supports these giant corporations and helps them because they want their technological offerings. You know? um, and so, if we want remission, uh, how, how's that going to come? Are we supposed to boycott the, the, the big corporations? I mean, what, what's the what's the antidote here? Well, I mean, the corporations. I mean, the people within the corporations still are theoretically discriminable from the corporations themselves. And not many people, you know, except it in the, the sort of traveling ar- aristocratic executive class, really care how big the corporation is, if, as long as it will give them a livelihood and give them a chance to do something that they find vaguely interesting. So there, there is no ultimate allegiance to bigness from within. And the fact, you know, I remember what was it in uh, the 50s and 60s when they were breaking down AT&T and they broke it down into all these baby bell corporations which have since morphed back together again that's the thing about these things once once they're alive and <laughs> they're out there they can still eat each other and get bigger and bigger and bigger but there was no noticeable breakdown in the service for people in the states and there was often much better response than when AT&T ran the whole system so they broke it up into, into, what, seven or eight the baby bells, and they could have continued breaking that down further. I mean, the idea that you can't do things because you're not huge, you know, I mean, when you look, you're by, I don't know what your camera is, with Panasonic or Nikon or whatever, but almost any of those productive areas that produce those things don't have to be that big, and they don't have to be part of something that also sells washing machines and also something that does you know, automobile financing. I mean, the point being that if you have a group that is trying to do something, whether it's making cameras or, you know, making email services, they, that does not require a great deal of scale to be profitable. I mean, it's, it's kind of hard to think of anything really necessary to the human future or the planetary future that cannot be done by a bunch of smaller groups that are effectively networked together. You know, I mean, four or five hundred intelligent people working together can do a hell of a lot of stuff. So, so you're saying, for example, let's pick on Sony here. Sony, the giant entity, causes harm to the planet, but Sony, if it was split up into a company that makes cameras and a company that makes microphones and a company that makes computers and da 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 um, that would... That would stop being such a negative influence on the planet and still provide the same service at the same price? I can't guarantee the price point. (laughs) I mean, again, it's saying like, because you produce food with pesticides and herbicides and and total, you know, ignorance and apathy toward the environmental health, that you can get cheap food, you know, and therefore we should 
everybody wants cheap food, so we got, we got to have you know Conagra and Archer Daniels Midland and Monsanto. I mean that that just makes stuff cheap, isn't that what we really want <laughs> from life? <laughs> you know, cheap stuff. I mean, you start to think about George Carlin's stuff routines <laughs> at this point. So, so yeah, I mean, ba- rebalancing the environment, uh, both social and ecological, is going to cost more money than we're used to paying because w- most of the things that we're buying, we don't see the real cost of, and we're not paying the real cost of. They've been externalized in the, the economics mm-hmm. classes. I mean, that, so the impact of disposing of this camera or what's going to happen with the heavy metals in it afterwards, you know, or... All of that stuff is not really included in the price. You know, it's sort of like a nuclear power plant. You know, they, the implications downstream are avoided because they, they negatively impact your profit margin. So, anyway, to that degree, it's the international post office system, for example, is run out of a little brownstone house in Geneva. You know, and the, all of the international uh, bookings for airplane flights these days is essentially a virtual activity that, that's spread among hundreds and hundreds of networks, and doesn't have much in the way of staff, and yet it gets people to their planes, and it, it makes things function as we're used to having them function. This is not a, a Luddite vision that says you have to, go, have to go back to the beginning, but it's saying that. All of the technology now we have to look at together, and we have to make one big decision. Does this technology concentrate power, or does this technology distribute and democratize power? And I think that's got to be the primary decision point at all, from, all, from all public, whether it's governmental or NGO kinds, of how they're going to approach and how they're going to fund, and how they're going to prioritize things in the future. You know, They'll, Because every time you make a decision that concentrates more power, you concentrate more risk, you take away more democratic uh, alternatives, more... Con- I mean, it, the system gradually assumes so much power within itself that democracy just becomes, you know, it's like democracy in, in North Korea. It, it's just a total fictionary slap on t- seal that they stick on everything but really doesn't feel or act like it and and so okay we've identified the, the cause of the problem and we've identified you know the, the big corporations are like a cancer in our world and we want to remiss them um still not clear how we actually go about remissing this this you know cancer how we make these corporations uh, break up into smaller corporations how we how we make the whole big thing become smaller there's a, that's a, that's the cool thing about the immune system because it's got all different kinds of talents and that's the cool thing about the potential aspects of, of the activist population of the world, the so-called blessed unrest. You know, They're all divided up now on symptom focus, but ten, if you could get 10% of them, and there, and there are millions, I mean literally millions, of people out there doing things, to get them to focus on bigness as a central pathological fact on the planet and something that they have to pay attention to and something that they have to bring their tools and their particular you know ideologies i mean in the the small i in terms of their own belief systems and so that immediately you could pick up all the people that that the back to the land people the slow food people all of the people that are trying to work for organic uh, agriculture in every aspect that you ha- I mean, you need two things. You need the replacement system to gradually grow up, and you need a subtraction system to essentially pull away the, the corporate canopy that's keeping the sunlight from reaching the ground level and the grassroots groups that, that could really feed off both the government money that's poured upon the big corporations and the market potential that is there for the things that are out there. But, but it seems like what you're saying is that you want all of the different protesting and organization activist groups all to harmonize and work together on the same topics, right? I want a significant percentage of them to, yeah. I mean, I, I want them to think about what the world would like, what their particular field of interest would look like if Monsanto were suddenly divided up into, a, you know, 50 little companies. 
what that would do to their lobbying clout, what that would do to their governmental influence, what that would do to their ecological impact, and what that would do in terms of, of bringing them back within the tattered democratic fabric so that more local entities could decide about their policies and their future. And the other big thing, I mean, one of the, the biggest obvious uh, avenue of remission uh, is through the corporate codes. I mean, we still, as a public, I mean, this is almost a fiction now, but not quite. We still, as a public, control what how corporate codes are written in each state in the United States. I mean, there's no national corporate code or national chartering system. Everyone ha has to come through some state. And in and, and when it operates, in, I mean, most of them gather up in Delaware because Delaware has become such a corporate whorehouse, and they don't really give a shit what anybody does. I mean, there's, I think, in big areas of Delaware, there's, there's more, corp theoretically, more corporations living than people. And that's even true in the city of London. You know, there are more corporate citizens of the city of London than there are biological citizens. <laughs> so there there are places where they issue from, but to operate, for example, in the States, they, if they want to come into Maine, if they want to come into Idaho, they have to go to the Secretary of State and get permitted as a foreign corporation. And the, for, and the, the context w with that is set up there. In the old days, places like Wisconsin had really severe r rules. I mean, most states did. Wisconsin held on to it longer than others. But corporations there ha had to exist for a certain, they had a stipulated lifetime. They had they had a, a open books policy that because they served the public interest, the public had a, a right to understand what was happening within them. You know, they had, there were a, they didn't, they couldn't, call on any of the constitutional protections against, you know, uh, unreasonable search and seizure, like an environmental group coming in or the OSHA groups coming in to look for safety and stuff like that. That's, gonna, that's all blocked now because they have constitutional rights. You know, they, they have grown within the system to grab all of the, these powers, but we still have at the root within their corporate chartering system, we can still define how they can operate. And we can actually define their scale. There's no, there's nothing that limits us as a public from saying, all right, when you get to be a thousand people or, or control five billion dollars uh, in equity, you will divide down the middle and start over again. You know, and that is a perfectly feasible approach to to the way to approach new corporations. Going after the ones that already exist, you, you're going to have to come in. With again, you're going to have to come in with public pressure. You're going to have to go in with direct civil disobedience. You're going to have to go in with all of our our standard protest kinds of activities, and also from the legal side, you know, t to essentially say that. And you're going to need a political backup and a political will that says, all right, within ten years, all of these corporations are going to be reduced to ten percent of their current scale, and we'll continue doing that till they get back to an ecological level. And there's even people that have, that have made up little tax algorithms that essentially would reward shareholders for that 10% reduction each year so that they would not be financially victimized. And the, the corporation itself would start to dissolve into shareholder, stakeholder communities rather than just shareholder communities. Because share, the shareholder communication is just how much and when. They've only got one metric, you know. It's all perfectly, perfectly understandable and perfectly decimalized. But the other stakeholders, the customers, the people that work there, the suppliers, the people in the surrounding communities, they have a lot of other metrics that they want to say, this is really important too, the fact that you don't screw up our water and you don't pollute our kids and you don't, you know, destroy the local economy in the, in the process. So all of those people... Ha in a democratic society, are going to have to have a voice over the, the the powers that are actually deciding what their future is going to look like. And and I, I mean, one thing this these massive corporations uh, causing these huge problems on the planet it's it's also a recent illness, right? I mean, it it, it wasn't existing a hundred years ago, at least in the same way it is now. I, um, it was existing a hundred years ago. That's why you had the populist movement. It was the railroads then. That was the Gilded Age. 
That was 120, 130 years ago. It's essentially the, all of the, the industry that had risen up in and around the Civil War in the North suddenly started to, to go crazy with, in, between the steel industry and the railroads and the petroleum industry. You, you, had, you essentially had the, the format for all corporate evolution in the States from then on. And it was then, it was in the 1800s, that they lobbied their ass off and got constitutional protections. See, so it's been since then that things have been getting bad, basically. Yeah, every, yeah. No, but I mean, for Americans. Mm -hmm. But you also have to take one step back and say, things were really bad in the colonies, and it was not the, it was not King George so much that was oppressing people. It was the the Hudson Bay Company, the uh, East India Company. It was the East India Company that set off the Tea Party that blew up the revolution a lot of the revolutionary energy in the first place. They were they were major corporations and they I mean the East India Company, with its internal armies in tow, conquered India. And and so I mean your your main solution to this is that we all harmonize and unite together and, and you know, all of the different activists pull together into the same focus and objective. Um, but isn't that exactly what we've seen with the Occupy movement? I mean, that that's just a ragtag group of everybody who's pissed off trying to make change, and, and so far it hasn't really achieved anything apart from just a, you know um, a noise on Wall Streeters. But that's it. I mean, you know, how are these people? Because the, there's no common focus there. You, I mean, people walk in there with all different issues. You know, I mean, they they see the the Occupy. I mean, I see the Occupy encampments when or when they existed as lymph nodes, you know, I mean, they, they're equivalent. They were people that were, they were suddenly aware that something really bad was going on. They, they swarm together and then they tra trade information. And that's, that's what lymph node have. I mean, when you have a bad infection in your body, your lymph nodes got all exploded because all, you have all of these cells racing into them and there are many cells being produced out of them and a great deal of confusion about what the hell is going on and who we should be producing as antibodies and what we should be producing you know, is antigenic forces for these maladies. Okay, so they got to identify the malady first, and then they figure out what it is that they're supposed to be producing, and then they start producing that in huge numbers, you know. And th that is what essentially constitutes an immune response in most cases. And they, so they, they fulfilled the first part. They got everybody together, and they started inviting old-timers and, you know, people who had been working in the fields of activism in all these different arenas over the years would come in and tell them what their problems were, you know, and it, w it could be everything from farm workers to the, I mean, it also could get racial and, and, and gender related. It's everybody who, who was looking for a larger audience for their particular cause came in there to brief. And there was, there was no common message that was distilled out of that. And the, and and I maintain that had they they all said, well, what are the common denominators here between all these people that are working on agriculture and the people working on oceans and the people that are working on energy and blah blah blah? What 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 is the common denominator of that problem? And they would if they'd all looked over their shoulders, they would have seen these huge corporations that were either worsening or profiting from, or in some cases flat out causing these issues. So, if that if that shift had come, you know, and that that's what drives me crazy because I have so many activist friends and in so many relatively specific areas of of expert activity, you know, people that really know a lot about the forests, and people really know a lot about the oceans, and people really know a lot about nuclear power, and that that's a learning. I mean, it's a long learning curve. For, for activists to really be able to talk intelligently, accurately, and incisively about their issues. And when you ask them to back off from that, you know, it, it's very difficult because the, if, they're really, if they're really focused on the cure and saying, okay, what we're doing is not working, <laughs> you know, and, if you, and that's what you look for in the activist world, the people that realize that at the rate we're going and the way we're working, we don't have a chance to prevail at this time. You know, it, the, the timeline just doesn't work. And the activists of the occupation, the short 
beautiful occupation era, are, are sort of coming around to that. But others are scattering back to the ground and going back to very specific issues and saying, okay, the activist, I mean, the occupation as a centralized thing, we, we change the conversation where people now talk about the 1% and the 99%. They've identified inequality as a huge and, and as far as we can see, almost <laughs> incurable ill in the society. And we don't know what to do about it. So we're going to go back and we're going to protect this for, foreclosure group or we're going to go in and protest this particular bank or we're going to you know, stand up against this Walmart over here. But it, it's starting to break down again. And so that, that moment when everybody came together and they say, okay, and I'm not trying to harmonize everybody. I mean, the, th the great thing about activists is, and the great thing about people on the left and progressives and even on the libertarian fringes, they don't want to get harmonized. I mean, they don't work together very well. They've all got their own egos. They've all got their own, you know, shtick. And they, they want respect for that. And if somebody is telling them this is how things have to be done, that's almost the surest way to get them to, to say, fuck off. <laughs> you know? I, I will either keep doing this or I'll figure out something, but I'm not going to follow any orders about how activism is supposed to work. So there's only two things you can do. You can give them good examples about things that actually do function in certain areas of activity, and they will, they will often gratefully learn from that by watching what, what has happened. Or you can tell them, all right, you can do this any way you want to, but what we got to do is we got to take this huge thing and bring it down to human scale within 10 years or, or enough time for us to be able to survive. And get our way out of this this deadly suicidal era and you can do it legally you can do it illegally you can do it with arts with crafts with music you can do it with satire you can do it any way you want but the goal has to be shrinkage of these things because they're our evolutionary competitor for the future and they are going to kill everything in us in the process of their growth so if we don't get ahead of that curve we got no future to argue about activist tactics and strategies, you know. And it it's just the idea of identifying in a compelling way, in a way that people can understand and believe, that this really is the biggest problem we face. Bigness is the problem in and of itself. And after, I mean... The greatest, the greatest excuse for the hugeness of government, for example, has either been the hugeness of the enemies and the threat that was usually chronically, methodically, and intelligently provoked to make sure that the enemy was always really looking scary to your people to keep that part of your, your defense establishment growing. And people's need for protection from the other companies the other corporations in society who would rip them off, poison them, or, you know, assault them in a variety of different ways. So a lot of the regulatory areas of government, which is some the ones that have grown fastest and gotten the most bloated, are theoretically justified by they were going to protect us from the big corporations. And then, of course, the big corporations went in the back door and bought them, and now they're part of all the same infestation. And so we're threatened as much or more by government now because they have the they have the force of the state. They have guns behind them to support the corporate will. And that, as everybody always points out, is the definition of fascism, which is essentially corporate interests backed by state power. And uh, we're getting there. Um. I mean, you were talking before about the idea of the body and how this is a, a kind of, you know, metaphor with, uh, you know, the idea that corporates, sort of corporations are like cancer inside the body and the body is like the, you know, the society we live in. Um, in the body, when, when there's an illness, usually it, it starts to respond and fight it. I understand what you say with cancer, sometimes the body feeds it, but, you know, sometimes it, it remisses it and it does this kind of automatically. I mean, um, there's this, there's this thing that switches on in the body which says actually this cancer is bad for me I'm going to attack it and I'm going to get rid of it why has this not happened in our society so far why have these corporations been allowed to grow so huge and cause such massive destruction 
um, without anybody, without uh, 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 any antibodies coming and stopping them. I mean, why is this happening? Well, they have a certain primitive intelligence, so they can adapt to the environment, and they can also inform the environment. And the, I mean, the tumors. I think you're overstating the bo- body's ability to uh, knock out cancer. It seems to be a fairly, you know, big contender for who's going to kill off the most humans this year. Cancer is usually up there in the, the top rungs, you know. So that, I, I think that's a, a little overstated. I mean, we're We've got a lot more cancer-producing influences in life now, so that they're having a hard time because they're, the cancer is getting more enhanced by corporate society than the immune system is. The immune system is usually getting depleted by it. So it's not a fair comparison, <laughs> I realize. But the, the thing is, when these things, just as a tumor figures out how, what it has to do to, to grow within the body, corporations, once they've lost their specific mission of activity, like we're going to make the best bicycles in America, and then all of a sudden we're going to just make anything that moves, and then finally we don't, we're just going to make anything that makes us money, that that is the, the, the beginning of malignancy. When something has a very specific purpose and it's related to an area and a need, business is fine, you know, but... When it decides that it's gotten so big that it has to diversify, so it's lost any sense of public utility, then then you're cancerous, you know, because your own growth may, matters more than anything else that's happening around you. So the fact that there is an intelligence obviously at work with it, like I said, there's thousands of people that are paid to focus on the activities that will make the corporate entity thrive. It's got a lot of, of intellectual juice in very tiny channels, but it's all focused on one thing. Protect itself to grow. And part of the, part of the growth thing is, is reaching out into new markets, exploring new areas to exploit, and part of it is looking at the whatever's going to inhibit its unchecked proliferation. And that is primarily public policy or local resistance from local groups. And therefore, it, it has to reach into the public sphere and either disable or turn around all of the things that are supposed to be working against it so that, that it's, it is supported rather than hostily opposed. And that, that's been the history of, and that's why lobby is the biggest, what? I mean, in terms of historical levels of influence peddling, the lobbying population today it is it's just unimaginable. I mean, you have 400 lobbyists in Washington for every legislator, right? <laughs> you know, and billions and billions of dollars change hands. So that... That works against any spontaneous cure. And that plus the fact the media is obviously totally owned and run by corporate entities that are in league with other corporate entities to protect this system. You know? So the, the primary sources of information we have in a democracy, the primary levers of power we have in, in a democracy, and the primary regulations that we have fought for in the past to protect various aspects of the democracy, whether in terms of our bionic selves or our ethical selves or our uh, political selves, all of that has been contaminated and essentially in the process of dismantling. And it doesn't really make any difference, for example, this fall. Who wins? I mean, Obama has taken America... I mean... Chomsky always talks about corporations as private tyrannies, you know, I mean, just in a sort of historical thing. <clears throat> he doesn't have the idea about their their life energy yet. He, I mean, I, I've talked to him and I've tried to drag him up to the top of the mountain and say, look down and see the, these things as they spread and, and just imagine that you could see all the attention flows and data flows as living things within this this group of buildings or information networks and it, it would look like life and it would be life because it's fed with each of us as a as a as a, as a node 
as a nodule, as a, a expressive cell within that body. And so when that energy comes pouring out, it, it is, if it's only got that one single focus, it can, it can blow away almost anything in its path. And especially when it, it allies with other similar entities who are facing the same, the same uh, blockades of, of its growth from public policy. So they form manufacturers associations, they form trade associations. And individually and in bulk, they hire these thousands and thousands of lobbyists to subvert the democratic process. And they're winning. <laughs> well, that's the thing. Let's say you did get everybody to, to tune their attention to the same topic, which is, you know, let's the big is bad, let's bring it down, let's get it small, let's split up corporations into smaller organizations that focus on special skills. Um, even if if you could do that, presumably the system is just too rotten. I mean, the, the, the corporate powers have so much power, um, you know, through lobbyists, for example, that even if a proposition was to come up um, that people could vote for, um, or even if that law was passed where corporations had to become small, presumably they'd subvert the whole thing and get the laws changed back in their favor within you know, 10 minutes. No, that's, that's why it's got to be you know all hands on deck kind of assault from humanity. You know, and it it has to come from consumers, it has to come from from the suppliers, it has to come from people in the community, it has to come from the wives and children of people who work in these corporations. It has to come from every angle. I mean, it has to be there has to be that great eureka moment, saying, "Whoa! Not only do we don't we need these things. I mean, we don't need these things, but they are actually the common denominator behind behind." <laughs> all these problems that, that we've been facing and thinking are going to kill us and kill the planet. I mean, once that, that wake-up call goes through, I, I don't think the corporate esprit de corps, the will to live that they have, I, I don't see that becomes noble or sustaining or even encouraging for people with inside it anymore. You know? And fortunately, that w- within the corporations themselves, the inequality has grown, grown so huge with these multiples of like CEO salary that's four or five hundred times what, what the basic salary is at the company. People don't feel they're in this together much anymore. And there's a lot of people in the corporations who are helping with this whistleblowing stuff and who are also looking for a path to the outside, you know. And, and so what's your, what's your means of getting everybody tuned, tuned in and turned on to the same problem? I mean, what's, how, how are you going to make this happen? How are you getting the message out? What's, what's the plan? I'm obviously not getting the message out because <laughs> <laughs> I have tried making videos. I've tried uh, writing in a variety of ways, in academic ways, in journalistic ways, and I've science, science fiction ways. <laughs> And, and you, you ran for a governor or a vice president or something? Before? I ran for vice president, yeah, in New Hampshire uh, in 2000 in the primary election there. N- New Hampshire and maybe Arizona uh, still allow vice presidential primaries so that people can say who they want to be vice president as well as who can be president. Uh-huh. So anyway, I, I, re- I ran on that on a anti-corporate ticket and uh, won every county in the state. Wow. Yes. Um, okay, so obviously people are interested in this. Um, so, so I mean, how do we make this happen? Right? Okay, so not just you. If we put all the onus on you to unite everybody together, obviously it's not going to happen. You obviously. Know, so, so, so what do we do right now? The people are watching this video. If they say, yes, okay, I understand. Big is bad. Let's get them. What do they do? What's, the, what's step one? Well, we put up some stuff on, on the web. We have this thing called the Sacred Animals Party. So if you go to sacredanimalsparty.net, it sort of outlines a variety of things. That we, we tried to set it up as a, a sort of a phony political offensive um, that acts like that I'm running for president or something, but trying to represent all of these interests and ideas. Essentially, that the ideas are far more important than the people involved. And once those ideas start to get linked together in people's minds, that they will start to see what it is they can do. I mean, the, the, the creativity around occupation itself is, and the indignado movement in Europe and, you know, even the hydrangea revolution over here in Japan. When you get a lot of people together, you get a lot of ideas. And 
the, it's the new ideas that are going to help us take us over the top because corporations know how to deal with everything activists know how to throw at them now. They know how to deal with protests. They know how to deal with petitions. They know how to deal with public perceptions. They know how to, to spin the, the media uh, environment so that the protesters look like the crazies <laughs> rather than the, the only force for reality and sanity in the world. So every, and we go after them with court cases, they got better lawyers and they got thousands of them, you know. So if we can't hit them in government and we can't hit them in the courts and we can't hit them in the media environment, we got to find a new place to hit them because they're not going away. If, and we're, we're lining up on, it's like the old warfare things, you know, main army comes at you and instead of going around and picking them off like good guerrillas would in the our army marches out to the front and hits them head on and gets crushed, you know. So we basically have to go back to guerrilla tactics on every front, you know. And so, and the immune system functions that way. They, they don't organize so good. They don't approach in big phalanxes where they can all get mowed down at the same time. So all of that is is still possible. The, the only issue, of course, is getting that eureka moment for people to say, ah, yeah, that that really would change things so profoundly if we could get a hold of organizational scale. Corporate scale initially, then governmental scale, and then God, God pray, even religious scale, you know, to bring things back to the ground level, to the living level, the sensual and the spiritual and all the stuff that where we really vibrate the most profoundly and in most resonance with the world. That is where we have to bring politics back to, and economy. And you have people that are doing that, the transition towns movement. I mean, there, there's there's an extraordinary list. I mean, like, again, that blessed unrest thing that uh, Paul Hawkins does about all the NGOs in the world. And he just screens up through screen after screen after screen. I mean, there's hundreds of thousands of groups they have in their one little database, you know. And that that's just scratches the surface. So there's enough of us out there. It's still it's still a small percentage. It's still less than ten percent of the population. But the point is that, that if we all go, if we all raise the hue and cry, because ten percent of the people that's why I always call them the magic ten percent. They're the people that a respond most intuitively, most empathically to problems in other places and try instead of running away or or just disregarding that they, they move in to help. It often at you know considerable peril and risk to themselves. So that that group of people is out there. They're, they're just sort of they're committed. They're the ones that the, the the single issue groups feed off of to to make their causes run. But they some of them are, are getting pretty fed up with the fact that all these single issue cause campaigns are not adding up to anything looks like a human victory. Um, so we just got one minute left of tape. Uh, do you have a kind of final message uh, or legacy or just a, just a kind of word of motivation to, to that uh, 10%, the magic 10%? No, I, I, I just believe that if you really look at what is going on and what has gone on for a number of centuries now and, and start to look at it as a process of life, and look at, at the, the world, I mean, this is the next step beyond the Gaia hypothesis, that we are also a function of that life. And what we have created out of our communities, these entities, these super organisms uh, that are corporate or governmental or military, religious, they have grown beyond our control and they are threatening everything we face. So if you can look at that as a scale problem and realize that everything, everything, would be so much improved on our planet and in our future if we could bring these down small enough that we could control them democratically and they would actually represent greater interests than the the narrow <laughs> the narrow uh, spectrum of greed that they represent now